Hey, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I'm standing in front of the SPD-5 Dauntless. And yes, we're going to be jumping inside for inside the cockpit. Big thank you here, of course, to the CAF Georgia Wing for allowing us access here. They also offer living history flight experiences on this particular aircraft. So if you ever want to fly in a very historic aircraft, this is the one you should absolutely have a look at. And of course, I don't have to talk about the fame that the SPD has because well, if I do have to explain it, just ask the Kido Butai about 120 miles north of Midway. The Inside the Cockpit series, of course, uh, sponsored here uniquely by Patreons, channel members and the crowd funders. And a specific thank you here also to Brian, who's sponsoring this episode. Now, let's get into it. Before I jump inside, let's do the walk around as always. Up front, we have a Hamilton Standard propeller, pitch range 20 to 48 degrees, and the diameter is 3.1 meters. The engine behind that, well, that is a uh, Wright Cyclone, the R1820-60, and it produces a maximum output of 1,200 horsepower. Now, that doesn't sound like much, and yeah, it's not that much, but the SPD was called at some point during the flight slow but deadly for a reason. Now, if you want to get to 1,200 horsepower, well, you have to crank her up to uh, 2,500 RPMs and 40 six inches of manifold pressure but of course that's war emergency power you're not going to be flying along with that setting for overly long so we're propping it down to cruise 2300 rpms and 40 inches on your manifold pressure the engine does feature a two-stage supercharger and if we look closer here you also see that scoop underneath that is for the oil cooler and that scoop can be manually deployed by the pilot in flight depending on uh, what he requires of course for cooling since this is a nine cylinder air-cooled radial engine that's the only cooling that you need and then you of course have the outlet flaps on the uh, on either side of the aircraft going around the cowling because uh, well the engine the air goes inside cools the cools the cylinders and then the uh, hot air is then injected via the outlets now, as we come towards the side of the aircraft, we have the bundle exhaust right here. And then notice also the wing. Now the wing does become dihedrally angled at the outer portion, but here it is at a fairly straight angle coming out as a low wing on the aircraft. The angle changes considerably. The gear also folds inwards towards the fuselage. You can already see the weapons and a camera there as well, but I'm going to talk about the weapon systems on the port wing as always. Let's walk along the leading edge then. So flying these slotted intakes where air can go in and then reinforce the boundary layer on top of the wing. We have navigational lights and then we have canvas covered ailerons. No trim tab on this one. And then we come of course to that very very prominent feature of the SPD. If you've ever seen any sort of pictures of them, these air brakes double also as flaps. So the lower portion doubles as a flap that travels along the trailing edge all the way to where the uh, angle of the wing changes again, goes underneath the fuselage and then extends on the other side of the uh, port wing as well. But the top portions here are then also the air brakes. And as you go into your dive, those will deploy pretty much like split flaps just on the, on the, the other side of the wing and uh, it will open up like so along alongside with the flaps and break the aircraft during its dive in order to ensure that it doesn't go too fast and that you have enough time to take aim at some carriers. The aircraft itself features two fuel tanks in either wing. We have a 90 gallon fuel tank and a 65 gallon fuel tank. The first one is your main, the second one is your aux, but there's also provisions for protective fuel tanks with rubber linings. And once you do that, of course, the capacity decreases because protective fuel tanks usually have less capacity than unprotected fuel tanks. At that point, you'll have uh, 75 on your main and 52 on your aux. Okay, and then here we have the second cruise station. Up front is, of course, the pilot. Back here would be the radio uh, operator as well as the defensive gunner operating a twin 30 cal. That's 7.62 millimeters. And uh, that would be uh, providing some close range protection for, for the aircraft. We have a storage department right here for, uh, for the crew to use. And then as we move alongside the... Uh, fuselage. It is a semi-monocoque construction and the aircraft weighs, depending on how you set her up, 6,000, 7,000 pounds over to uh, 10,000 pounds. The uh, 
horizontal stabilizer right here. Once again, canvas covered control surfaces on your elevator. And we also have a variable trim tab. And then if you look at the rudder, same thing there, canvas covered rudder and a variable trim tab attached to that as well. Swinging then around, Let's have a look at the other side. We, of course, have a tail dragger, so there is a tail wheel. It's not retractable on the SPD. And then that prominent white black device there, that is your tail hook. So if you're landing on a carrier, you want to have that hook catch one of the, uh, one of the cables that are uh, strung across the carrier deck in order to facilitate immediate stoppage of the aircraft as it lands. And yes, we're on an airport, so you will be hearing exactly that. The life raft and emergency rations are stored inside, as you can see yourself. And then, as we have already done the wing on the uh, starboard side, let's walk towards the wingtip. You can see there is a variable air learn tab right here. And then we walk all the way around. Pedo tube. And then let's talk about the weapon systems. Now, the SPD. Dash 5 has a, a larger weapon system or has a higher capacity, carrying capacity than the earlier SPDs. And you could have any bombs mounted on the outboard pylons on either wing, one pylon there, 100 pounds to 365 pounds of bombs. And then the center line could mount a 1,000, even a 1,600 pound bomb. So that's a lot of explosives heading your way in case you happen to be unfortunate enough to be at the receiving end of an SPD. For close in protection and you know, if, if, if you ever get into a situation where you have to defend yourself, the aircraft also features 250 cals in the new nose firing a 12.7 by 99 millimeter cartridge. And that rounds us up on the outside of the SPD now. Let's jump inside and I'm so excited for this because this is one of my favorite aircraft of all time. The time has come to jump into this Dauntless. A big thank you to the Commemorative Air Force Georgia for this fantastic access. The plane's cockpit is largely original with the exception of various changes required under modern flying regulations. They also offer flight experiences with the Dauntless, so follow the link in the description for more information. In typical fashion, we will go through this clockwise. We start on the pilot's left then swing over to the central instrument board and then hit up the right hand side. Finally, we finish this off with the stick before jumping into the rear seat for the gunner. Starting out on the far left, we find a radio control box and then on the console, we find the tailwheel lock. Moving forward from that, we have the rudder trim control as well as the aileron trim control tab. And then the big wheel is for the elevator trim. Set beside this is the fuel tank selector switch and a similar selector for the external fuel tanks if they are carried. Set behind this are pull tabs for parachute flares and not shown here is a hand pump that is next to the elevator trim control. Moving forward to the throttle quadrant, the black handle in the back is your blower control, commonly known as the supercharger. And then the large prominent handle is the throttle with an integrated press to talk button. And the slightly obscure handle on the lower end is for the propeller pitch control. Unsurprisingly, the red handle is for your mixture control. And then we have a tensioning wheel for the quadrant controls. And set in front of the quadrant, we find the ignition switches. Below the quadrant, we have the bomb arming handle as well as the bomb release lever. And the lever on the bottom left of the pilot is the arresting hook release lever, with the visual indicator beyond the lever being the original landing position indicator. Moving towards the front and starting at the bottom, we find the cow flap control that is on the left here. And then we also have warning lights for the landing gear. Then moving upwards, but sticking to the left, we find one of the two forward firing 50 cows that the Dauntless has as offensive armament. These are synchronized with the propeller. Before we move to the central instruments, if we look up top, we find a whiskey compass. Just above your instrument gauges, we have the original mounting point for the reflex gun and dive bombing site. Then let's have a look at the main instrument gauges going from the top to the bottom. We have an airspeed indicator in miles per hour, then a modern VHF radio, and an altimeter in feet. 
On the second row, we find a rate of climb indicator, then we have an attitude indicator, a directional gyro or heading indicator, and the turn and slip indicator. An oil temperature and oil and fuel pressure gauge is found in the bottom row, together with the manifold pressure gauge and your engine RPM gauge. Then in the lower console, we have a clock with an elapsed timer setting, the cylinder head temperature gauge, as well as the outside air temperature gauge, a hydraulic pressure gauge, as well as the suction and the fuel quantity indicators for all tanks. Below this, you'll find the oil cooler air scoop control for manual extension and retraction. And finally, we also have a bombing window. This allowed the pilot to fly almost over the target and keep it in sight, and then transition into the dive. It is a feature you sometimes find on other dive bombers or US Navy aircraft. All right, moving onwards to the right, here we find a ammunition counter for the 50 cals, and behind this you have modern starter switches. The larger space below this was originally used for the autopilot, carburetor air control, primer pump, and the OG starter switch. The electrical control panel is just below this with an integrated amp and voltmeter. As you can see, all the main systems route back here for electrical power. All right, moving onwards to the right, here we find a radio and intercom control panel, the appropriate speaker microphone, as well as the receiver tuning head. Then we come to the various control levers on the right hand side. The larger white handle is the landing gear release, whereas the yellow lever is for the dive flap deployment, which releases both the top and bottom dive brakes to their full deflection. Compare that to the inner lever, that's for the flap control that moves only the bottom set of the flaps. All of these handles operate in conjunction with the manual hydraulic control valve. A visual indicator of the flap deflection is then found right next to these controls. Set above this, control switches for the aircraft's radio direction finding system. And then finally on the right we have a oxygen regulator. The red handle there is the emergency hydraulic hand pump. Finally, we come to the stick, giving you pitch and roll control. It is a conventional setup, set between your legs, and of course your legs operate the rudder pedals for your control. And then we have the conventional trigger for the guns, and the button on the top was for the electrical bomb release. Last but not least, and a very neat feature in the Dauntless, a deployable navigation chart for the pilot to use. It is marked 4th of June, 1942. I do wonder what happened then. Then we come to the rear seat where the gunner would sit. However, though this position would operate the twin 30 cal defensive guns, the duties also extended to navigation, spotting, radio communication and more. The front view from this position is quite limited. Towards the front we also then find radio sets and receivers. And we have a small control panel for lighting that is found to the gunner's right if he looks in the direction of the travel. We also have a Morse code tapper and then to the front left we have a throttle control as well as a now empty panel for instrument gauges. Usually this was a speedometer, altimeter and clock. As far as I understand it, it was standard practice for the rear operator to shout out altitude readings via the intercom during a dive bombing attack. This gave the pilot a bit more freedom to focus on aligning this aircraft on the target. If the throttle control confused you, here as a backup you can see that there is also a flight stick that is available. This could be mounted in the appropriate connector to allow the rear seat to take control of the aircraft in case the pilot was incapacitated or for training purposes. Finally we have the defensive verticals. This twin flex turret is stored in a small tunnel behind the seat and deployed by the gunner. The guns fire when the red tabs are pressed. The gunner would also have ammo boxes for backup and, at least nominally, smoke tanks. This was a bit of a leftover from the interwar years where the Navy experimented with the offensive and defensive use of smoke deployed by aircraft during naval engagements. He also had smoke grenades which I understand were mainly for signaling purposes. Now it is your turn, let me know your thoughts about the SPD, its history, this tour and the cockpit. Did anything surprise you? What did you learn? What do you want to add? Let me know in the comments. I want to thank the Commemorative Air Force Air Base Georgia based in Peachtree City, Georgia 
for giving me this opportunity to show you their flying dauntless. They often tour the country, so check out the link in the description for more information. If you run into them, let them know we sent you. As always, have a great day and see you in the sky.